Okay, thank you, thank you, Harish. Um, yeah, well, it's been very interesting so far. I always see a lot of people coming in, and then like it's, it's a lot of back and forth, and um, so awesome here uh, to see all this activity and um, the interesting talk so far. And uh, I'm very pleased to go uh, into more depth now um, with our next topic, which is next slide. Artificial Intelligence, Cloud Blockchain, uh, please take out the S, and the Conversational Web. Where is it all going? So um, that's the big question here. Where are we heading? Um, Harris just uh, um, had a few ideas of his own, so we will get back uh, to this later. Um, but I would like to and ask uh, to invite um, some of our panelists, uh, um, or all of our panelists, of course, here uh, on the stage and introduce them to you. They're coming from all over the world, so please give them a big round of applause when they are coming. And uh, I would like uh, uh, the first one to ask uh, to join us here, uh, Ramji Venkateswaran. We practice a bit. Uh, for First, uh, Ramji, please join us here on stage. So, we'll yes, it's your applause. Come on, give him a bit more, please. Like, show. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ramji. So, um, uh, Ramji um, has benefited from having worked alongside and to have been mentored by some incredibly talented, talented, and nurturing folks. Uh, without whom what professional good fortune he had wouldn't have been squandered unwisely. Uh, this is what you write on your LinkedIn profile and uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. And uh, yeah, you have a very interesting uh, career. You're currently the global head of cloud ecosystem development and head of cloud services Asia at JP Morgan. So um, yeah, we will also get to the security aspect here uh, when we uh, will uh, join, have the conversation in a moment. And uh, you have worked for Goldman and Sachs. Um, but uh, your background is uh, mainly um, like technical. You have been uh, involved in, architect, uh, in uh, architectural aspects of um, IT. Um, but uh, not just technical. You have also been involved in um, a photography studio uh, in Manhattan. So you've been LinkedIn stalking me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, Looked it up, yeah? And uh, so uh, I love that. So that's actually um, a very good example for the community that we have here, like people like who uh, engage in lots of different projects, different aspects, and so on. So it's great to connect you, uh, connect you with you uh, on this panel. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for the welcome. The next one I would like to in invite is uh, Ms. Uh, Liang Mong. Yes, hello. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, Liang Mong uh, was one of the pioneers who spearheaded the digital media and business at uh, Singapore Press Holding. She is currently the head of digital technology and leads a high-performing engineering team to develop and support the various websites and mobile applications for SPH uh, flagship new brands, including The Straight Times, Liang He Zaobao, and so on. Her team is also responsible for technology exploration and innovations. Thank you very much for joining us. The next one uh, is uh, uh, Dr. Graham Williams. Please come on stage. Um, some of you might uh, remember uh, uh, Mr. Williams from last year. Um, there have also been a lot of uh, meetups here. So actually, the, uh, um, yeah, the conversation that we have here is a kind of a continuation of uh, what we've started last year. Um, Dr. Williams is Director of Data Science, Cloud AI, and Research um, at Microsoft Asia Pacific. Um, his background is uh, um, like he has been uh, to the uh, Australian National University and he leads a team delivering innovative uh, cutting-edge AI and machine learning to the enterprise and developing tomorrow's advances in AI. So very interesting to talk to you about the future of AI and your background is um, uh, open source software. Uh, since the 80s, I can't read out uh, uh, everything here, but uh, you have been uh, involved already in the 80s as a data scientist. I think a lot of people didn't know the word <laughs> back then. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so You've been, uh, you're originally from Australia and uh, um, from the uh, uh, University of Canberra 
1984, um, you've been involved in the project uh, for Emacs uh, uh, package uh, managing, uh, packaging uh, as a package manager. Sorry. Sure. Okay, so welcome, Mr. Uh, Dr. Graham Williams. Okay. And uh, the last one we have here, uh, but not the least, of course, is uh, Frank, Frank Karliczek from Nextcloud uh, in Germany. Uh, welcome. So uh, Frank has been a keynote speaker at uh, FOSS Asia last year, but he has also uh, spoken at the um, Open Source Summit in the US and uh, many other events. He is the face of Nextcloud uh, as the founder, of course, as well. And uh, some might also know him as the founder of OwnCloud years ago. So uh, Nextcloud is the successor. Um, but Frank is not only, like he's German, by the way, and uh, uh, has not only lived in Germany, though. You have also lived uh, several years in the US, um, in the greater Boston area and uh, worked for um, Hive Zero One. Yes. So, um, based in Stuttgart, by the way, so good opportunity to connect with Daimler then as well in Stuttgart, as they're also based in Stuttgart. So, um, yeah, let's start the conversation. Nextcloud is an open source uh, um, solution. Uh, yeah, or maybe you explain it yourself. What, what, what is Nextcloud and how uh, do you use AI in Nextcloud, what is AI in Nextcloud? Thanks a lot. Uh, great to be here, by the way. This is one of my favorite conferences here. It's really an honor to be here back this year. So um, Nextcloud is um, an alternative to Dropbox and Office 365 and Google Suite, with the main difference that it's 100% free software and open source, of course. So that's a free software conference here, so it should be obvious. So you can actually run it wherever you want, which is nowadays really important if you want to protect your data, you want to run it in, every, in a trusted hosting center. It really runs from a small device like a Raspberry Pi at home if you want. Most p companies or universities run it obviously in a bigger instance. And the biggest instance at the moment is for a service provider for 20 million users. So everything from very small to very big. Um, I'm actually very, very proud that, um, that Nextcloud is 100% open source. It's done by a really active community. So the last release we had, according to our statistics, over 500 people from all over the world contributed to it. So it's one of the very most active and, and vibrant open source communities. And we also have a company where we offer services and support around it, where we have like 40 people based in Stuttgart at the moment, again with a 100% open source business model. So similar to companies like Red Hat, for example, which are really our the poster child here, obviously, so 100% open source business model. So. Okay, thank you very much for these insights. I would like to make a first round because, uh, before we go uh, into the conversation uh, um, deeper. Um, uh, Graham, um, my, we know a lot of products uh, from Microsoft and uh, it's been fantastic last year to hear uh, how Microsoft is engaging more and more in, in the open source and free software uh, community. Um, what's happening in this area of um, AI, of cloud services um, and so on with, um, uh, uh, in Microsoft? Mm. So, so thank you. Um, so what's happening? I mean that there's an enormous amount of um, activity and, and excitement across across Microsoft, across many of um, uh, the, the large vendors worldwide, um, all around the, the development of AI and machine learning. Um, so I've been in, in the AI space, machine learning, since, since the 1980s. Um, and, and this is really the third, uh, sorry, I'd say it's the fourth surge of interest in AI. And actually, each surge, we get a lot of the same questions. Um, is this the end of the world? Will AI take over and so on? And I'm with our, um, our previous commentator um, from Red Hat saying, you know, AI is going to augment what we do now. It's not going to take over. It's going to be augmented intelligence. And the work that we're doing in, in Microsoft is, um, and actually before I joined Microsoft, most of the work that I was doing was based on trying to share what we learned. So I, I come from both the AI and machine learning research community, but also a very strong contributor to open source software over my career. Um, as, as Mario mentioned, starting in the uh, 1980s with 
Um, before open source was even thought of as, I guess, a concept, um, we just set up FTP servers and put our software on there. Um, a, a package manager for Emacs was something that we worked on at the ANU in Australia. Um, packages for the tech typesetting system that we made and shared freely available through um, FTP servers. So open source has really been part of my makeup um, for all of my career. Um, my, my most um, widely used package is something called Rattle for the R software, um, statistical software, all open source for doing data science and data mining. And the focus has always been how do we share what we learn, what we discover, and allow others to build on what has come before us. And open source just provides such a great model for doing that, and some of our earlier speakers have highlighted that as well, building on the shoulders of those who've come before us. And that is so important to the future of um, all of us and, and of society. Um, it is such a shame, I think, over the history of, of our computer um, vendors, of many products coming to the market um, and then disappearing and being reinvented and rediscovered over and over again. There's so much intellectual capital that goes into that. So, so what we're trying to do in Microsoft is how do we enable and empower everyone to do, uh, to achieve so much more with the technology that we have available? Everyone on the planet, as, as Satya likes to say, how do we empower every person, every organisation to do more? Um, and we have a real focus in our data science team on capturing what we learn as practicing data scientists, developing new machine learning algorithms, and exposing that openly through GitHub repositories, through documentation repositories. Our code is available in the open source community to replicate the work that we do. But we're making available algorithms to build your models, your machine learning models. We're making available the platform to execute those models and recent announcements from Microsoft and other vendors around, um, uh, particularly around Windows and incorporating a machine learning execution capability in the operating system itself so that the models that we build can be shared openly and execute on those platforms. So we've got a real focus not only on developing um, new algorithms and technology, but making that available and empowering everyone. Empowering everyone's part of it, but there's also what is going to be next in AI. And it's a real focus around what's beyond deep learning. Deep learning, AI, surge at the moment, massive compute with massive data, what's beyond that? Neural networks, as our previous speaker noted, is old technology. There's a lot of new developments, but it's old technology. What else from the history of AI is going to come to the fore? And one of those things, I think, is more knowledge discovery. We don't know what a neural network is really doing. It's an incredibly complex mathematical formula. Where do we get the knowledge from that? What discoveries do we make by building neural network models? They work incredibly well. They appear to be intelligent. But we need to go beyond that to discover knowledge and then use reasoning to work with what we've discovered to reason about the world that we're interacting in. So we're just starting to see the emergence of new um, other areas of AI that benefit from massive data and massive compute in this area. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you very much. You gave a very good uh, keyword for uh, Ms. Liang uh, because uh, uh, data. And, uh, uh, of course, you are connected with uh, um, um, a lot of customers, a lot of readers, for example, on your websites and uh, also journals. So you have a lot of data. Um, how do you uh, uh, analyze this data? How do you use it already? Um, are there already uh, applications like where you say, okay, uh, we uh, analyze it in, in, and use AI to, to um, improve uh, what we uh, provide to customers, or how do, you, how do you use it? What insights can you uh, give us to your work? Okay. Uh, well, SPH is a business organization, so we run, our, we, we are very ca careful about bottom line and profitability. So the way we view technologies is how it can increase revenue, 
or increase user engagement. So you're right, we have lots of data in our organization like content. So when my team embarked on this um, um, you know, AI and all this emerging technology, we really look at how it can apply across that media value chain. So broadly speaking, we look at media value chain as the news gathering, the content production stage. Now, in this stage where our reporters write stories, um, we are looking at tools where they can scan all the social media to see what are the most uh, buzz, uh, what are the stories that they should write. Uh, we are also looking into robot journalism. Right? Now, in the content distribution stage, now after content is being produced, we need to distribute. Now, that's where a lot of challenges. We used to be just a print company. Now, we have websites and mobile apps. But readers like you um, don't expect this kind of a user channel to receive their news. So they are now looking at voice assisted uh, devices or various other ways that they can get their news. And they want news to be personalized. They want news um, that you know, they want. So this is where content recommendation using AI and machine learning come into play. So when we tried machine learning, um, data based on news content to be able to do topic modeling was something that we were very uh, excited about. We have the content. User data. To be able to do a content recommender that can you know, recommend based on user behavior was something that really you know, um, took to us a step back. We, we suddenly realized that yes, we have user data, but we have not been keeping it in a very usable manner. So this is the, the stage that we are right now. That um, we, we, we suddenly also realized that the newspaper business is not longer just going to be a content business. You know, our real ambition is to become a data uh, company where we know our users very well from the various touch points and then use those data to bring more revenue to the company. So we're still, still touching it. And then the last stage is, of course, the content you know, analysis. Um, how do you get insights from all this content? So um, we, we are also applying some technology in that area. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much, and uh, um, yes, I mean, like, we want to hear more, of course, also about the products you are using uh, in a moment, but, like, let's uh, move on first uh, uh, to um, the banks, uh, right? Uh, so, um, I'm hearing about data, but I'm also hearing, uh, uh, like, uh, concerns about uh, security and so on. Um, what is your uh, company doing here? What is JP Morgan doing? What, what, what is your work, uh, what, what is involved in your work? Oh, thanks very much. First of all, thanks very much for having us here. Uh, it's an incredible event and um, I think a whole bunch of my, uh, my team will be around in the next few days. Uh, I've seen them walking around with smiles on their faces just to uh, be involved as 12 tracks with here, which is more than I've seen for a long time. Highly nerdy content. I mean, you mentioned architecture and various other bits. I started off my career being a network nerd at an ISP. I'm a Unix nerd through and through. So when it comes down to being around the kind of subject matter that I really get exposed to at conferences, I'm really glad to be at this one. So, um, coming on to that as a personal note aside, uh, JP Morgan is a, is a company, um, and I, I'm lucky enough to represent it in, I guess, with two hats, one of which is to be responsible for a chunk of work we call cloud ecosystem development, which is about how do you actually make um, the use of cloud as a substrate meaningful to the people within the bank who actually have to do bank-related work. And it's really about the concept of undifferentiated heavy lifting, you know, um, why does everybody have to know how to build a VM if what you really want to do is price a bond? Right? That, that sort of question. And then uh, I'm responsible for uh, the strategy and delivery of the hybrid cloud strategy in Asia. So that's really how, do we, how are we using cloud? How are our customers' um, data being thought about? How are we making sure that we're exactly to your point, um, protecting the firm at all the opportunities and therefore implicitly protecting our customers? And I think there's an interesting uh, implicit point in a lot of what people have been talking about, which is, uh, I read the other week, uh, someone said it far better than me, that sort of data is a new currency, in essence. I mean, yes, there's Bitcoins and blockchains and all these other kind of bits, and I, I'm always amused by the fact that if we had design thinking and something else onto the, uh, the, the thing we have here, we've become fully buzzword compliant. But from a pragmatic perspective, data is now um, something that we need to protect, but the value of it goes to uh, very minimal once it's been breached. So unlike gold, so if you steal a bar of gold, it's very hard to duplicate it, you've got to go mine more gold. Our data is incredibly easy to duplicate. So customer data especially, but any data is very important to protect. And we put that at the heart of a lot of our strategies. And uh, we'll talk about that more, I suspect. But it's going to be very important as we think about moving into a more and more autonomous future where we're expecting uh, 
processes to independently think about analyzing data um, based on triggers and signals, which we're again not going to be human initiated, how we think about access to data and information for those processes. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, but uh, I would like to get uh, uh, more into this point, like wh what is uh, uh, JP Morgan? Uh, doing in this area. What, what are your next steps? Like, so, so we're talking about the future as like this big thing that will uh, uh, happen uh, at one point to all of us. Um, but like you are sitting in the office, yeah? No, I mean, absolutely. And so, I think yeah. it's interesting. So, so Jake Morgan, for folks that aren't familiar, and I know that uh, uh, we're a very much a, a North America retail brand. So that's, it's well known, but also I guess in Asia Pacific, folks will have heard of us, I hope. Uh, but we are a hundred billion dollar financial services company and we spend about ten billion dollars a year on technology and I think this is one of these interesting I, I hate throwing numbers out like this but I, I went and looked it up on the, on the chart and it makes us slightly smaller than Ecuador as the country goes the amount of money we spend on tech and it's kind of mind-boggling so um, uh, what are we doing is not an easy question to answer I'm afraid but um, let me give you a few examples of the kind of problems we have to solve in our retail uh, brand, we still have a lot of check writing businesses, so we have to be thoughtful about the fact that the people that are signing checks are having to you know, validate those signatures. So there's a reasonable amount of how do we know that the, che the checks that are being written are actually being correctly uh, cashed. Same is true for contracts that we sign with uh, third parties or our clients sign or we sign on behalf of clients. Again, there's a lot of physical paper still in the world floating around um, that we in an ideal world, obviously like to digitize and get rid of and, and make magical, but still it's a huge amount of custody flow that we need to think about there. Then you look at the other end of the business, which is uh, perhaps not measured in, in bits of paper traveling across the world in hours, uh, but instead is measured in the time it takes for us to take a signal on market data, pass that through an algorithm in order to make determine whether or not a customer trade should be executed or not. And those things are measured potentially in hundreds of microseconds, maybe milliseconds, and the gamut of possibilities between the two plus the surveillance and regulation, all of which fall into uh, what we do as a technology company. So it's a, um, it, I would say it's a challenge that's probably on par with the, the automotive industry, certainly a level of complexity that I'd never considered before. It's a wonderful talk. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a huge opportunity for us. So um, I think there would be an obvious question now uh, people say, uh, what do you do about blockchain? Uh, interestingly, you didn't uh, even uh, uh, say that blockchain, the word, <laughs> yeah? Um, but like, I would like to see it in another direction. I would like to know, um, uh, we are here as, uh, um, at an open tech event, right? Um, you are uh, engaging here at this event. You said you, you're not really at uh, many events. So, um, so the question is like, uh, um, yeah, you see a uh, potential, you see an opportunity with open source, you use a lot yourself, yeah, I think, um, so a bit of background about myself, I suspect, is that it, it was quite a pleasure because the booth that's opposite us downstairs is the free BSD booth, and I got quite excited because I went over and had a chat with the chap that was sat there because I think I've been using, um, uh, I understand that open source is 20 years old, but it's, often, it's obviously a lot older than that. Right? I think the GPL was like 1989 when GPL version 1 came out, and the Barclay license has been around forever. Right? So from a pragmatic perspective, the sharing of ideas and thoughts is... Uh, it's a part of my DNA, and certainly I've gained a lot from it, and that's standing on the shoulders of giants kind of point. Internally within the company, I think we've probably, like many large companies, have gone through a bit of a deep introspection, right? There isn't really um, a banking business without technology anymore. A trading business is really predicated on it, and a, uh, a business is a store of trust and an actor on somebody else's behalf. Trust now involves that data component, as we were saying earlier. So technology has now become the heart of what we do. So we've had to learn and change and grow. And part of that is moving away from a vendor ecosystem where we don't actually get the opportunity to understand what we're doing. We just trust that somebody else is going to do it for us. And it's an outsourcing discussion. It really is a, I don't want to do this. I don't need to be good at this. I need to let someone else do it for me because I've got banking to do. Well, these days, banking is tech. And so we don't get to, even if we, we, we chose to, and I think the, the fact that I'm sat in this seat at JP Morgan is a sign that we haven't chosen to, um, we don't get to make that choice anymore. We have to be involved in what we do. Open source is by far and away the most obvious way to do that.
right? Um, so we use a lot of open source internally, and we use a lot of um, uh, not just the obvious sort of Linux, Ceph, various other things like that. It's in it's in areas where uh, previously we wouldn't have been able, been able to push, but people have started to do things. I was fascinated by the um, the open source uh, conversational uh, web. Uh, piece earlier, I took, I took down a note, I'll be taking that away, because everyone wants to build a chatbot, because everyone's got customers internal or external, well if there's an opportunity to be, in, be part of that loop and then contribute back, there's a great uplift in not everybody solving a problem that isn't competitive advantage, but still delivers value to everybody. So, um, Frank, I would uh, come back to you, because uh, uh, you are representing uh, um, like the open source community, m many many people, as you said, like more than 500 contributors. Um, so uh, we are talking about the future, and uh, like everyone sees an opportunity with open source. Um, so, what do we need to learn to stay ahead of the competition as an open source community? That's a good question. Thanks for asking me that, because I think this is one of my my main points I want to make here is that, um, I mean, this event is called um, FOSS Asia, FOSS for Open Source um, Free Software. So um, I think we all have to remember what it actually means. I mean, this is like, was basically, at least this term free software invented by Richard Stallman, which basically defined this based on four principles. Like the first is that everybody should be able to run the software, to run the program, it has to be able, you have to be able to run it to be open source. Second is you have to be able to study it, the source code, and to change it. And the third and fourth talk about distributing it to others. So this is like the fundamental of open source and free software that we are talking about. That is the fundamental of communities like us here. If we define us as the people who contribute and build technology, not only use technology, right? I mean, using technology, using some nice web services run by some nice big American companies, this is easy. But this is the open source and free software community about building it. And for that, we need these freedoms. And we all agree that machine learning and artificial intelligence is the future, and this changes the game. This is, I find this quite interesting, this changes the game. Because um, how does this work in the future? How does, how does the open source and free software community can still participate in this world of machine learning? Because it, it becomes more complicated. Let's say um, some big company, I don't want to say names, um, has like this nice algorithm where it studies like the behavior of lots of people, of lots of data, big data, right, and analyzes something, right? Then, um, of course, the question is, first question, okay, where's the source code? First of all, lots of the stuff is not really open source, right? I said, we are open because you can use our APIs. That's not open source, as I just described. You need more, you need a source code. Okay, maybe this company is then very nice. Let's call it, just for fun, Facebook. Right? Could be anyone else. But they're in the press lately, so there's some interesting interviews with Mark Zuckerberg today and on CNN. Let's say, um, let's say op um, Facebook open sources the full source code of Facebook. Right? Then we have one, right? GPL, right? We have one. Well, not really. Because what can you do with this software if you don't have the data? Right? This is all about the data of the people. This is, you need a machine learning, like an, a neural network is dumb, right? It's completely useless. You can you can run it and it does nothing without data, and you need the data, and the data is not really available. Let's say, like Facebook is even nicer and also open source the data. Well, what do you do with it? You can't do anything because it doesn't run at home on your laptop, right? You need a bigger server cluster for that, and this is also like not available for us here, right? So the danger for the free software and the open source community for us here is that we become users of the community and no longer builders of the community. And it's a quite, quite a danger for our movement here. And also, it has implications for privacy and security and for innovation overall. So there's a danger that artificial intelligence and machine learning leads into a future that basically like five big companies can innovate and the rest of us becomes users. Can, can I? Yes, yeah, I see you nodding, that. so yes. <laughs> Frank raises some really interesting uh, points and, and, and some really important points that we as a community really need to get on top of and understand. And I guess I, 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 I'm probably a bit more optimistic by the sounds of it than, uh, than Frank about where we, are, um, where we are going. And 
I, I think the optimism comes from seeing the enthusiasm and the talent in, in the open source community. And also now, and I've only been in Microsoft for two years, and I'm understanding and learning the, the change in culture that's happening in, in such a large organisation that was so anti-open source um, for, for very many years, um, realising the importance and, and um, the significance of what open source has actually contributed to society and to development and, and so on. Um, one of our, or one of the exciting things I see from my point of view as a data scientist, an AI um, machine learner, um, is that I, I do now have access to massive amounts of compute very efficiently on the cloud, fairly cheaply, um, uh, at my fingertips. You know, it, it took me three years in the Australian government to set up one of our first um, completely open source stack-based server network in the Australian Taxation Office. Three years of working with our IT departments to get that open source stack for our data scientists into the organisation. Um, it now takes me five minutes to push a button and on the cloud have a server available to me that runs the full open source stack of everything that I use as a data scientist. Um, Python, R, TensorFlow, CNTK, you name it, that a data scientist uses, it's on that stack. And that is now accessible to me. I fire that machine up, I do my data mining if I've got the data, and that, that's another issue um, if we've got time we'll come back to. But um, I can do my data science and then shut that machine down or, or, or park it and fire it up when I need it again and dynamically rescale it. And I know it's a bit of a buzz phase, but we, we like to say, you know, the, the access to an AI supercomputer is there on the cloud now at the push of the button. Um, pushing the buzzwords a bit too much, but there's a lot of compute that is accessible to us and becoming even more accessible and cheaper um, in the cloud. And that, that's giving me, as an independent developer, access to compute power that otherwise would have been in the, uh, in the big vendor space. So. Yeah, I was going to actually add something to that. It's, it's a very good point. The cloud, uh, which obviously I'm a huge advocate of anyway, but the cloud certainly is the ability to get access to huge amounts of compute resources previously unknown. Um, there's another side to it, and I think you've probably been more directly involved in that than certainly I have, which is the ability to actually do that sort of machine learning, to have techniques and tools available to you, has become democratized, to borrow an Amazon word. Um, probably even in the last five years, in a way that it hadn't been in the previous 20 years. Learning Fortran is hard. Um, and the third piece, and I think this is where uh, we're seeing the other side of it, is that data and having data available in um, data containers that you can apply metadata to is something that's also become far, far more um, available. And I think there's useless stats like 90% of all the data in the world has been recreated in the last two years, or there's five zettabytes of data out there. I mean, it's all, all completely functionally useless, but uh, it sounds good on stage, right? But the, the, <laughs> the other side of that means that the combination of these three things have now made it possible for almost anybody to garner insights from them. If you have a large data set, if you have a credit card, and if you have a couple of university graduates, and, and, and that democratisation, I think, is so important. We, we are making an effort to ensure the new algorithms that we're developing are becoming available in open source. Um, mo most, if not all, of my work and, and the team of my data science, my data science teams, is published now on GitHub. We work with enterprises. We capture what we do with those enterprises and then share them as templates, basically, you know, templates of code on, on GitHub. And we're also focusing on um, going up a layer. You, you saw some code uh, of, of TensorFlow um, earlier. Um, it's really hard to know how to analyse images using TensorFlow. Um, and yet we also saw the API approach, which in one sense dumbs down the whole process and makes it really simple just to load in some images and do some machine learning, but it's very limiting in what it can do. There's a middle layer there that is so important that captures the expertise of knowing that you've got to manipulate some of these images in this way typically before you build your models. So we're focusing on that middle layer to see how we can democratise and make 
more of this AI and machine learning technology available freely. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, not, I'm not so sure about the democratizing. I mean, if you look at the old world for a second, right? If you look, for example, how Linux was built. And uh, Linux, this was done by, by Linux in his basement by a commodity PC, right? He basically sat down and wrote this thing. In the same way, like lots of other open source free software projects were founded. You need like no resources. You need no, no, you don't need to pay any money to Amazon or to whatever to run virtual machines or something, which are, by the way, not cheap if you want to do big data. Right? This is made, I'm sure you can do have the budget. I'm not sure like every student here has the budget to do like big data um, uh, analysis on AWS. Right? And not even talking about the data itself, as I said before. So I'm not really sure this is really so democratic. So the I question think, I think, is... I think uh, quite democratic. Sorry, just to, it's an interesting point. You're right. It's not democratic in that it's not federated down to the individual. Um, it is democratic in that it is no longer simply in the hands of a few large vendors who hoard onto that secret and then extort license tax from you. I think is that's, that's probably to, to, to sort of be more specific around it. I mean, the, the example of this is there's a, there's a category of analysis that used to be only available to... Well, here's the story. The, the Walmart uh, CEO used to fly over or send planes out that would fly over other... Um, uh, competitors' car parks in order to take photos of it. And only he would do this. This was in the 1950s, right? So that's like 60 years ago, whatever. Uh, more than that, I guess. And um, he would have that data brought to him. They'd look at it over a weekend. They'd make a few predictive and uh, sort of analytical guesses and would get the jump on what was going to be happening, what they should be putting in their stores. Now we know that's old hat, right? That sort of stuff that's, that really is 50 years old. Uh, we have microsatellites that are able to effectively look at pretty much every part of the Earth and previously, I'd say 10, 15 years ago, there were a handful of groups that would have access to that data. Now it's much more substantially available. You're right, it's not available to anyone. It's certainly not available on a small budget. But it's not available, you don't require to have to spend millions of dollars to get off the ground with it. And I think that's the key point. Okay. Okay. I think, um, like, uh, I would like to get the perspective of uh, uh, um, uh, Liang as well. Um, but like, uh, I think we're touching uh, several questions we won't be able to, to solve this year. Uh, one question is the, the source code uh, um, of the applications. The other question is uh, uh, where does the data come from? Um, of course, companies who have acquired this data and put in a lot of resources to get this data, they want to keep this data. Then there are other uh, um, entities, like let's say even states uh, in Europe, we have the uh, data protective uh, uh, laws, right? So they say uh, you're only allowed to keep a certain kind of data, a certain number of data, and so on. So th there are rules that come in place here. Um, so yeah, the question is really who owns the data and what is our end goal? Is our end goal that everyone has the source code or is our end goal that everyone's controlling the data and so on? So I think this is a very long discussion that will take over years and I see like different approaches in Asia, China, let's say, right? I mean, in the US and in, and in Europe and uh, I'm very curious to see uh, in, in which direction we're heading. But I would like to come back a little bit also to the question here, um, uh, open source, so, so SPH, uh, like uh, on the ground. How much open source are you using already? Um, uh, are you already engaging in projects? Like, uh, do you work together with an, any open source projects? Uh, do you have already like a code online or do you plan to release it uh, of some applications that, uh, that you use in the company and where you want to connect with the community? It was interesting to hear them you know, debating over as a person contributing to the open source. Uh, for SPH as a user, we are the benefiter. So we have not you know, so-called contribute proactively into the open source, but we definitely benefited a lot. When we started our machine learning and AI, I don't have data scientists or math you know, experts in my team. And uh, my bosses were actually very skeptical. Uh, how are you going to start uh, AI and machine learning? But thanks to all this open source, you know, ready to use machine learning framework, tools, um, we were able to you know, start exploring. So thanks to the open source community, um, I, I'm actually also very curious how as an enterprise like ourselves, we can contribute back. Um, not directly in terms of you know, giving back the code, but is, is there any way that you know, we, we, we can uh, you know, bring forth value back into this open source uh, community? Yeah. Sure. So um, I'm um, involved in the KDE project for a long time. I started like 20 years ago. At the beginning, um, everybody in the community we called developers. But later we changed the term to contributors. 
because that's a way better fit because there are a lot of more ways to contribute than just writing code. Like you can um, help with testing, writing bug reports, help with translations, help with marketing, packaging, um, all kinds of things. Most of the better open source projects they actually have like pages where it describes how you can get involved. So there are lots of ways. You don't have to really do like development and you don't have to be a data scientist, which I'm sure there are not a lot of them on the planet. So, um, but there are a lot of other ways to contribute. Yeah. Mm. Depends on the project, of course. I think the challenge is often uh, um, like the, the organizational structure. The open source community wor uh, works in very different ways. And a lot of the IT community works in different ways. We're seeing step by step like that, uh, um, like other departments, they're becoming more agile and they're looking for different ways to, to organize their teams, like the teams are taking up tasks. We saw like tools where like Trello or something like that, where you can actually like say, okay, I'm gonna do this or that. So um, it is not just like a, a, a way like, okay, like let's go online and start contributing. It's actually a cultural change that is necessary in order to work together and benefit from the community um, and like companies that like plug in very well with this open source way of working together, they can also benefit because you can hire directly. You don't need to teach them anymore. Uh, okay, you have to like now do this process or that, uh, right? So if you already have similar processes, you can hire the people um, uh, very quickly. So um, there are many benefits to it. But uh, Ramji, maybe you have more insights here because you, uh, you work in a corporation and uh, SPH is looking like how do I work together with the open source community if I want to get started? Okay, data in the future, what you have mentioned, is still a big topic, but like, I'm, I want to like know, actually we're using open source, but we don't know how to actually engage with them, support them. You're now started, you're supporting Force Asia, you're present here, you uh, had a lot of media announcements, so that, that's great, but what insights can you give from your perspective? I mean, the procurement process within large enterprises is probably one of the biggest barriers here because you start a conversation and you say, well, I have this third party we've worked with for 30 years, we understand supply chain well, we have contracts in place, everything else is good. Oh, there's this three-person company that's actually, well, I don't know where they're based because they're, one of their developers is in Toronto, one is in Singapore and one is in Russia, and I think they're incorporated in Luxembourg. Oh, well, we'd like to have a contractual agreement with them, and that's, that immediately runs into a certain level of mind cramp. Right? So being an advocate and being a champion for the fact that that is actually how you get smart ideas in, you don't have to even necessarily contribute back. And the, there was a discussion, I think, earlier about the difficulties of getting through legal teams in order to be able to contract back. I mean, we, we're very fortunate at JPM, partly because of our size and partly because of the, the seismic shift internally. That's uh, an area where we're starting to see much, much more. We have 45,000 or so technologists working, a lot of whom do contribute back. But it's much more, I would say, about being a champion internally, being a champion of things that are correlated with the open source movement, but not necessarily the same. So agile, lean thinking, being able to actually have people be um, creating an open and trusting workplace so that it's somewhere people do want to work. And then invest in companies and buy software from companies for, that are open source and free software companies, meaning you're not buying the software, you're investing in them so they can pay developers who are going to write open source software. This is very true because even in SPH, for the traditional side of the business, they, they are still not very much into the open source. But for the digital side of the business, we really see open source as the engine of digital transformation. We, we are using open source CMS, open source you know, tools and SDK. So haven't quite encountered, I mean, so we, we have to get around and be brave in, in confronting some of these kind of procurement issues and so on. Uh, yeah. Okay, so that's where Microsoft taps in recently more and more. Like, uh, I remember like, I don't know, over 10 years ago, it was like, oh no, yeah? But like, Microsoft has changed a lot over the years. Um, it, it certainly has, and as, as I was saying, it, it, it's on a journey. It's not at the end of that journey yet in, in terms of open source. Um, but it, it's certainly heading um, in the right direction from, from where I uh, can see internally as well. Um, along that theme, if, if I can just um, kind of tie together a comment I was going to make to Frank and something about contributing back. Um, the, the, it's not just the algorithms that we're open sourcing though, it's the models that we build. And so, for example, these models that, that are classifying images to identify objects um, in the images, those models 
can take um, three, four, five weeks of multiple GPUs, massive neural networks to build and to get the accuracy that we're seeing. That's a massive amount of compute that's required. But what we're doing is making those models themselves openly available. And indeed, there's a whole movement around trying to... And what I was going to say was that a contribution back to the uh, community is uh, sometimes hard for commercial organisations to do so, but where it's possible, models that you build, share them back into the community to demonstrate how you are building the models, the algorithms that were went into it, the processing, and illustrating that to the rest of the community so we can share what we're doing um, with others. That also then leads into the um, uh, transparency around the models that we're building for policy development, for example, in government. All models that we develop there should be open models that we can test and validate the assumptions there. I, I'd love to also talk about some of the data issues too. But, um, I would so like, like, love to answer you, but I don't think... So uh, we're, we're getting to the end. Uh, it, it's a shame because I feel now it's really like we're getting to a very interesting point and it just means we have to continue the conversation. Um, so, but I would like to uh, uh, ask a closing question uh, to you and uh, um, to answer this uh, like from your company and personal perspective. Um, so like years ago it was very... Uh, like much easier to put on a conference, like let's say with, with a single th theme, yeah? You could say, okay, mobile technologies. Now everything is about the smartphone, right? So you make a conference mobile technologies and how we can do it open source and so on. Um, it was uh, very difficult for us to actually grasp all these changes uh, that are happening at the moment. Okay, we always talk about rapid changes and revolutions and so on, but right now, really, in so many topics, yeah? I mean, you can see, AI, machine learning, cloud, blockchain, conversational web. How can we touch all of this? It's just becoming more and more. But I would like to get a statement um, uh, from each of you, from your personal perspective. So what tools and technologies are most promising for you right now? I mean, it's interesting the point you make because I think uh, uh, IT kind of goes through cycles and we all see it and until you know, maybe something will disrupt the cycle in the next 10, 15 years, but I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. And so we're going through a cycle of pull the data back to the center and let's all compute in it. And I think the next set of things, and it's pretty common knowledge, is, well, the laws of physics still kick in. Uh, there's only so much the speed of light's willing to propagate through fiber or even through hollow core, whatever it is. So I need to do more work at the edge in order to be able to only send back signals. So you end up with this sort of, um, uh, I have a model at the edge, I have an incomplete model at the center because I've got a thousand other models that I'm looking at problem. I think that's really what the next few years are going to be. I think it's going to be about how do we do more at the edge. I think it's going to be about how do you, it really is going to be about the connected homes, but that's, that's sort of from a consumer perspective and I don't really know that much about it, but from a business perspective it's going to be around how do I make smart decisions about something that's localized, has a high volume of data that I need to process within the local scope, but that will be affected and will affect lots of other scopes and so there's going to be some uh, feedback cycle that we need to, to work our way through. It, it's all right now just beginning. I think we're going to see the, the sort of the, if there's an ebb and flow as it were in IT cycles. We're in the beginning of that flow. We're kind of moving back but um, it's going to be a lot of fun. Okay. I take it that your question is uh, asking whether um, you know how all these emerging uh, technologies, how do we view it, uh, it and how it affected our business. Um, definitely all this emerging technology, we see it as no more just a hype. I mean, usually they go through the hype cycle. So as a user organization, we usually have to be very careful and kind of assess whether it is still just at the hype stage or at the mass adoption stage, or you know, is it ready for us to, to get into it? So certain of these technologies, like let's say cloud computing, uh, surprisingly AI, we take it that you know, is definitely mainstream, is going to be ingrained into our business. But things like blockchain, I see it more like uh, you know, going to be reforming the industry, but it's not so soon. So we were just taking a monitoring uh, approach. Um, so, so around tools and technologies, I think, I, I think what we're seeing emerging and um, so, something that, that we're developing as well is, is how do we provide that environment, uh, the, the platform for um, doing data science, I guess, machine learning, AI, all of this data 
audience and stuff. And it is a science, so we call it data science. It is a science. It is about experimentation. And a key thing of that is how do we support experimentation? Things called parameter sweeps, where we are building models and we're looking at hundreds of different um, possible parameters and then choose the best model out of that. It's almost random search to find something that actually works. Um, how do we support all of this experimentation? And so we're seeing a whole platform being developed uh, around model experimentation, um, uh, model deployment um, and model management that becomes important when you've got so many different techniques, new techniques, new algorithms emerging daily um, into the open source community. We want to adopt those techniques, experiment with them really, really quickly and see whether they're going to be useful to us. So we want to shorten that cycle and, and get excited quickly with things that are really working for us and then adapt them for our own environments. So I think if you, if you look back a little bit, like 10, 20 years, then, um, and you think about the successful technologies like email, for example, email was successful because everybody can run a mail server and we can all communicate with each other. There was, there's no central mail server on the planet. Everybody can have one. The same with the World Wide Web. World Wide Web won against like this old like AOL and other proprietary services because everybody can run a website. There's no central instance. No one has, a, has the, the central hub of all web pages. doesn't exist. Completely distributed. But nowadays, with a lot of modern, more modern technologies, like we have, the, we have social networking, for example, or we have search with Google, and, with some others, we have the trend of centralization. So suddenly you can't really run it yourself. It only exists like once on the planet. Like Facebook exists only once, and Google exists only once, and lots of these other technologies, Google Assistant only exists once, and so on. So I think if you, to come back to your question, what are the most promising and more interesting technologies? I think for me, everything that's decentralized is like really interesting and something we should explore. So I don't, I'm not a fan of centralization. I think with the help of free software and open source and decentralized technologies, like a decentralized search engine, I just think someone worked on that, still working on it, uh, decentralized social networking, decentralized artificial intelligence, decentralized um, 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 machine learning, this is like the future. Very much right. So, yeah, and, and like I, I, I also want to take the opportunity when we do also uh, few words what we are doing here uh, and, and so actually FOSS Asia is not just a conference actually we are a uh, community is one of the largest uh, tech communities uh, in the world like of the top 50 on github and, uh, and so we develop a lot of stuff ourselves it's often, often like small projects um, but like uh, uh, so what's our motivation behind this right uh, we are very interested in the future that's the topic we started off with. They're like we are, we are excited. Like let's say like ideas. Uh, I have some friends here. Uh, they say, okay, we fly to Mars, but we can't connect with a central server on the internet here, right? Like so, so people have all kinds of uh, amazing ideas, and um, all these questions come up, like uh, data science questions. Yeah, I mean, like if you have algorithms, if like actually real life decisions and science are so close to each other, like it's not like in the old times. You have like some scientists, you find something and then years later we'll use it. It's actually data science, it's like part of every company. So uh, how do we replicate it? Science says that it must be replicable, right? We don't have the data, we can't replicate it. Yeah? Is it true what they're telling us or not? So a lot of these questions will be discussed over the uh, next few days. And uh, um, so they're questions in, into the future and they are questions very close, like the conversational uh, um, web. So this is something that's happening now and this is a, a topic over the next uh, few days and uh, the question how can we run it our, ourselves without having to connect to an external server. So uh, I hope you got inspired, well, I did, like I have a lot of new questions that are coming up to my mind and I hope to continue these uh, conversations here and uh, also the conversations how we can collaborate uh, in future and between different communities. I hope uh, you will uh, stay, maybe visit us uh, um, on some other days um, and be part of the tracks. And I would like to uh, thank everyone here on the panel, um, Ramji, Liang, uh, Graham, Frank. Thank you very much for joining us and thank you very much for giving us the opportunity here today. Thank you.